our lecturer for today's second lecture, uh, Dr. Milan Parivodic. Milan Padrovic was the Minister of the International Economic Relations uh, of Serbia and uh, Minister Coordinator for the Minister of Finance of Serbia during a period of uh, Serbian economic transition to the market economy. Milan Parivodic is a principal in the law. Parivodic Advocati uh, represent, uh, represents and advises international and local companies. His main field of experience is the foreign investment law, mining law, en environmental law, IP and IT law. He was also a member of bodies that drafted many law in process, uh, laws in the process of aligning Serbian legislation to the US, uh, European uh, Union standards. Milan Parivodic also was a lecturer in the civil law and the property law at the University of Belgrade from 1991 to, 19, uh, to 2004. Sorry, uh, just a moment. Uh, I can mention uh, so many more interesting facts about our lecture today, uh, but we need to leave time for interest, uh, this interesting topic. So without further ado, uh, I will give a word to the Mr. Parvodic. Mr. Parvodic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. So I understand that we are from many nations, which is wonderful, and that you have uh, come to Belgrade from 28 nations or something like that, I was told, right? Which is, which is like Babylon, literally. And you are all students of law, I understand also, right? From various universities, uh, from the European Union, um, how many people are from other countries, not from the European Union except Serbs? Which countries are you from, guys? Turkey, Turkey also. Super. I'm from Macedonia. Fantastic. Super. Okay. So, um, it's um, a pleasure to, to, to address you today. And um, I was asked on what topic I would like to speak. And there is um, one, one topic, and I am honored that uh, Professor Jovanovic has joined us today, our famous professor of commercial law. Mr. Nebuš Ivanovic. Anyway, um, in, in my career, I was um, some 14 years here at this law school teaching property law, and then I was a couple of years in politics as a government minister, and since then I'm a practicing lawyer. So, so I saw many things, you know, uh, theoretical, political, and uh, practicing law. And all together, you know, it's like after studying, it's 37 years in law. 37 years. I was counting today, actually, and <laughs> it's probably too much. So 37 years in law, and I, I just wanted to share with you some experiences that, uh, that have developed over so many decades, actually. And um, um, it's, it's, it's an incident of my life, actually, that I have worked on drafting many laws for Serbia. And um, some 12, 13 are laws which are in force. And about four or five others I have drafted, or participated also in drafting, not only exclusively drafted. Several I have defended in Parliament as a minister. Uh, some, some were not adopted, but about 12, 13 were adopted, and all of them are in force. And um, those laws have, um, are marked by a single way of thinking that I have developed over the years. And... Um, I will share that thinking with you today, uh, but uh, first I will start with the situation that my generation encountered. We were then a bit older than you in the 30s, you know, when, when uh, Milosevic fell in year 2000, 2001, and Serbia was then opening up um, as a democratic country. We had the first democratically elected government with a very Western attitude. And uh, uh, we had, at, at the beginning at least, we had significant support from uh, Western institutions like the World Bank, um, International Monetary Fund, German ministries, French ministries, Swiss ministries, and so forth, Greeks. So there was, there was a, a lot of support, and uh, the situation was quite dire in those days. And you can see it on, on this next slide. What was the situation? We had a failing economy. And just to get 
to, for you to get an understanding. I was talking to the man who went directly personally into the central bank when Milosevic fell to take over the central bank. <coughs> and in the treasury, they found 176,000 German marks. It is state funds altogether. 176,000, which is like a basic savings now of a family. That was the state property at that moment in cash. <laughs> 176, that, that is what, what we found in the, in the treasury after Milosevic, you know. So that the economy was, we were bombed in 99 also, seriously. So we had a failing economy. We had a failing economy. A political system which was completely dysfunctional and only to be built. A communist socialist legal tradition with many deficiencies embedded in it. Because it is a dysfunctional system. It's, you know, a socialist legal system is actually an anti-legal system by definition. Its essence is anti-legal. So, um, uh, naturally, after communism, you have destroyed property rights. Um, you have an e inequality in treating people before law. There is an ideology of protection of the poor. So, this has spilled over into an ideology of the courts. So, the courts... Actually, when they see someone poor, they do not really apply the law. They, they, they treat that person like a beggar and give them adjudication in the favor of, of the poor. Or the court is weak and then succumbs to the pressure of the strong, of the powerful, of, the, of, the, of someone who is close to power or rich or corrupts them. Uh, so we had, um, and still this is a problem, weak creditor protection, ineffective procedural rights before courts in the sense that you had a slow functioning of the courts, or futile injunctions. You ask for the court to react quickly, to, to save some property, to block a bank account, and it happens in seven months. The money is taken away far behind. <laughs> it's, it's completely purposeless, you know. If an injunction, if it's to, if it's to be effective, it, you, call, you ask the judge to, to pass the injun injunction, he does it in the next three hours. That's how it's done normally. Then an outdated normal technique... It's a French word, normal technique, right? Uh, uh, technique of drafting laws, normos technicos, right? Uh, an outdated draft uh, technique. You know, I remember, for example, you know, the European, you, you learn about European laws and you always have an introduction part, a general, an introductory part to, to, to the regulations uh, in European law. We still don't have those introductory parts, which are actually very useful. The whereas clauses. Because they tell you how to interpret those laws, the motivations of the legislator, why that uh, regulation was passed, you know, and many other things you can find which are useful to applying the text itself of the law, of the regulation. Uh, then you had a state, state monopolizing of property. Uh, in communism, most of the property is owned by the state. Uh, you have the so-called private property, which is like a toothpaste, a toothbrush, a bed, a pajamas, that's what you own, you know, but you, you don't have means of, pro, mean, means of, of, uh, uh, of the, you don't have factories, you, you don't have means of production. Uh, so you have a state monop monopolized property, uh, then um, the property rights of the people are actually usurped by uh, urban planning, by zoning laws. You know, normally in Belgium, you have the property law, and then within the property law, you have a certain margin how to decide about spatial planning, about zoning, urban, urban space organization. Here you have urban spatial organization actually depriving people of their existing pending property rights. You know, those are all systemic problems, you know. And to, to sum up, it was a paradise for dishonest people and a difficult environment for law-abiding people. Okay? So, um, actually, over the last 21, um, two years, I have drafted those 12, 13 laws and uh, a few drafts. And I'll just name a few and the problems which uh, we, we managed to handle and to resolve. And uh, probably the most notable I put it first is the mortgage law. And the mortgage law had several problems to be solved. You know, mortgage, that's 
hypothecation in European law, hypotheca. It's uh, the English and the Americans call it mortgage, but it's not exactly the same. Um, we are here talking about the European hypotheca because Serbia belongs to the continental tradition of, of, of laws. So the hypothecation law um, had several problems. You know, you have, for example, 10 million buildings, but half of the buildings, uh, 5 million, are not registered. Half of them, 5 million are registered, another 5 million are not registered. So basically, you can only put hypotheca on those buildings which are registered. So I found a solution how to put a mortgage on the other 5 million buildings, which are not registered, which has actually expanded uh, the portfolio of assets which can be mortgaged or collateralized with 100%. We expanded it, the collateral, for 100%. Like, uh, there, is, there was much more bankable potential. Uh, many more people could take money based on what they own. They could take money based on the property which was not registered because that property could be sold as unregistered property. If it can be sold, why can it not be put under mortgage? Because a mortgage is a conditional sale, right? You take a loan, and if you don't pay back the loan, then the property is forcibly sold. So it's a conditional sale. So, so basically what we did was to, to inscript the mortgage on the piece of land on which that unregistered building is built, and that was how we achieved publicity. We achieved publicity by registering the mortgage on the non-registered building, on the, on the portfolio of the piece of land on which it is built, which was quite extravagant at the time. And we had uh, several other novelties, and that was all happening in 2005. So what happens in 2006, uh, actually, the French Civil Code in Article 2420 does the same thing what we did in Article 4 of our mortgage law. And I'm sure that they didn't copy our law, but it's flattering to know that the Code Civil came after us in some reforms. That was, that was to us flattering. So that was mortgage law. Then, for example, foreign trade law. You are very young people, so many, most people don't know. When the Bolsheviks in 1917-18 came to rule Russia, when they overtook the Tsarist regime and, and occupied Russia, basically, what they did was to prohibit international trade to everyone except to those who are permitted to do international trade. And then they filled those companies which were authorized to, positively authorized to do international trade, they have filled them with their secret police people so that they could spy in foreign countries. So instead of every company in, nor you know, in normal countries, in France, Germany, Belgium, everywhere, you have companies and every company has the capacity to do international trade. Why not? And international investment. They have prohibited that and said only these 10 companies can do international trade. And then fill those companies with spies and send them all over the world to do business. Um, so basically, the whole principle was put upside down. Uh, instead of the principle of freedom of contract to everyone, everything was prohibited in international trade law in the Soviet Union unless it was expressly permitted to do something. We have copied that, fortunately, by it. Our communists were stupid enough to do that, the same thing. And we had it all until 2005, when... I managed to change it as a minister, completely to overhaul the system. So that law from 92, which was the law on foreign trade, was completely changed. And we have managed two things. First, to introduce the principle of freedom. So my ministry at that time was giving 24 or 26 kinds of permits and registrations for foreign trade. I have abolished all that and left only four kinds of permits to be issued by my ministry. Deregulation, one thing. Second thing, the, the beginning of the law says everything is permitted unless prohibited by this law. A principle of freedom. 
and third, align that law to WTO. Because WTO was a very hot topic, and at that time still, now it's in problems because of international politics. Uh, so we have actually aligned our international trade law to the principles of non-restricted non trade of the World Trade Organization. Now, to give you an understanding of the situation, well, you know, struggling to impose those radical reforms, um, I have encountered a huge resistance. Um, with the mortgage law, the resistance was universal. Everybody was against it. Um, fortunately, I taught mortgages on my courses for 14 years, so I knew it in detail. So I was 100% sure that what I'm doing is right. But generally, the idea was that once that law is imposed, Serbia will drown like Atlantida under the ocean. And we passed the law, and it released huge potential of the economy. It enabled project financing. It enabled a big boom in real estate development. Uh, a year ago, I was approached by one of the biggest real estate developers, and he said, look, haven't you done that reform? We couldn't have done anything with the old system. We couldn't develop real estate at all in Serbia. We would be like 50 years back, you know. But the thing is, the important message is that uh, there is a typical conservatism among lawyers. And that is not a good trait. Uh, to Not to change what is good is critically important. It's very important to keep everything that works well. Do not make changes for the sake of changes. Never. Keep everything that works well. But if something is not working, when, when law is an impediment to the development of the economy and the quality of life of people. Change it. Take responsibility and change it. In spite of the opposition that you may face uh, in, in your work. Then a third example is the law on mining. Um, you had all the mines were nationalized and became state-owned uh, from 1945, 1946, 1947 when the communists took over Yugoslavia. So now we have to change the system completely from a system which is made, a law which is made for state-owned mining companies, to switch it into a system which will actually protect the rights of private investors. Because there is no state money to develop mining. We want to develop mining. Uh, uh, so it, that the knowledge and the finances can only come from private investment. Um, uh, so, so we did that. And from 2015, I worked on that intensely, and particularly in 21. We managed completely to change the mentality of the law, to give guarantees to private investors, but also to very, in a very nuanced fashion, to balance the interests of the state, the interests of the nation, the interests of the environment, and the interests of the investors. All these interests of the stakeholders must be very finely balanced. And I was using, for example, the laws of Finland, Sweden, those countries in Europe are very advanced in, in mining law. Uh, some other solutions from Mongolia, from Congo, for example, and so forth. But the main inspirations came from Sweden and Finland. So we, we managed to change that also, a radical reform. Again, huge protests from within the ministry, from within the nation. Uh, but what happens afterwards? Once when those people, those people who are against reforms, they're not against because they're convinced um, that the change will be wrong. It's simply that they have not seen something different. They are not aware of alternative solutions. And they are deeply in that system in which they develop themselves. So once when, in spite of their opposition, we manage radically to improve laws and to release huge economic potential, 
afterwards, these same people are so proud that they have actually participated in that work. So that dynamics is very, you know, grati gratifying when you see the, the, those happy people, proud actually, of the good work in spite of the huge, you know, anxiety which they felt because they don't have comparative law knowledge. It's very important for you all to, in whichever field you decide to, to move of law, to have comparative knowledge. That is very important because it gives you alternative views of how to deal with a same life situation. Then there is the enforcement law also, which, which I have changed. Um, I don't want to go into further detail on that. Um, it, again, it was a no-brainer, but you had opposition. And then, you know, I, I came up with, with an idea which I then shared with a German notary who said, of course, we have it for so many years back in Germany. It's, it's notorious in Germany, you know. And I, I came with the same idea because it's simply logic leads you in that direction. And then you change it and then, aha, okay, now this, this works again. Also, um, uh, there is this law on effective protection of intellectual property rights. Uh, from 2006, um, we had a problem actually that the court, courts were slow to react with injunctions um, to seize counterfeited goods. So you have like a thousand Rolexes which are imported, counterfeited Rolexes or Cartiers which are imported into the country. And once when they cross the border, they are divided to many sellers and you can't catch it anymore. You have to catch it at the border. So basically this law has imposed a duty on the customs officers and then afterwards on inspectors when they see counterfeited goods at the spot to seize them. Not to wait for an injunction from the court, which is very slow, often not even passed. So this was again a very important law for the protection of intellectual property. Then the law on non-possessory pledge. I have worked on that law also in 2003. That was an important law because you know, you have the possessory pledge, you give something to someone else in his possession in order to get money, but then you can't use that asset. So it's very important actually to make something of a hypotheca, hypothecation for movables, for movable things. So we actually organized a register for um, movables and then equipment. Uh, uh, Thank you for coming, Mrs. Professor Drenovac. We are honored to have you here. Um, so this law on, on, um, uh, on non-possessory pledge actually enabled financing uh, and leasing, financial leasing, in the sense that now banks and financial leasing institutions were ready to give uh, financing uh, for machinery, which can be used from day one, but on which a pledge would be registered. That was another very important alignment, important for the economy. Um, there are many other details, but I don't want to take uh, more of your time. And there are other laws which, which we have worked on. I could talk for days, but I don't want to burden you with the details. On the other hand, um, after communism, the question of restitution is essential. Uh, of returning the property which was stolen by the state, by the communist state, to return it back to its true owners. So that was a process which, which was ongoing throughout Eastern Europe. And I have worked also on the law on restitution of religious property to the churches, to the Jewish community, to the Muslim community, and that law worked very well. On the other hand, being a professor of property law, my main ambition was to try to reconstitute, I think that's the best word, to reconstitute property law. Because apart from political freedoms, uh, which were completely devastated in communism, property, and particularly real property, which has the most value, uh, real property law was destroyed. So I was very keen to work on a general restitution law and drafted a general restitution law. And if I can say that there is 
something that is the most complicated thing I did in my life intellectually. It was drafting this law because you are trying to bring justice on the one hand to those to actually to typically to the hairs of those from which property was taken away. I say stolen. On the other hand, at that same moment, I'm Minister of Finance and you cannot buzz the budget. You must keep the stability of the financial system in the country. You must keep the state stable, the, the budget of the state. So that was a very challenging um, draft that was 100 pages long, which also included the restitution of um, construction land. Unfortunately, did not pass. The vested interests of those who do not want legal security have opposed and prevailed. And I didn't manage to go with, with, with this reform. Also, I have prepared uh, a, a full-fledged property law, which also did not pass. So awkwardly enough, Serbia now has a property law, the basic property law, from year 1980. And in the meantime, the country has changed its name several times. A political system has been changed twice, probably, you know. But still, we have a law from 1980, which is like nine years before the fall of the Berlin Wall, if you can imagine. And then innovation was introduced through the law on construction. So the law on construction actually became also the law on real estate property which is quite blasphemic that uh, the basic rights, such as real property, are regulated in the law on construction instead of being uh, very uh, precisely and integrally regulated by the property law. So these are some of the things that I did not manage to push through, although the drafts were finished. Now, yeah, these are, I didn't move the... This. These are the laws that the first one I managed to pass through, the three other ones, dra drafts, were not adopted. Now, um, being now, I will I'll come to, to some more fundamental discussions. This was more casuistic to give you an understanding of what I was doing with other people and uh, had, had the honor actually to participate in some major legal reforms. But um, when one thinks about reforms, it's very important as lawyers that you yourself have certain criteria by which you personally judge a law. You are too smart to allow yourself the luxury to be passive readers of the law. You have to have the toolkit to critically read the laws and be able to write better laws than those which are in front of you. You must be ambitious. In order to be ambitious, you have to develop certain criteria by which you will judge the quality of laws in front of you. And these are the criteria in which I personally believe and how I have taught my students, they're significantly based on a German philosopher, Gustav Radbruch. You have heard of Professor Radbruch, who was a victim of the Nazis, and then came to fame after the fall of the Nazis in 46, 47, and wrote a famous article, which is called, uh, like, Statutory Lawlessness. Statutory Lawlessness. Criticizing the Nazi laws. Because the Nazis said following theoretically Hans Kelsen. You have heard of Professor Kelsen, who first taught in Germany and then went to the United States, famous Hans Kelsen, the ultra-positivist professor of law. They said, whatever is passed by a competent body, meaning the parliament, in a statutory procedure, that is law. Whatever is written in it, without any regard to the substance of how it regulates those social relations. That is the ultra-positivist positive, attitude. 
you know, coming from a communist system, we hear this pies, that valueless approach to law. That valueless approach to law, which is simply formalistic, is a highway to despotism. You must have your own qualitative criteria of what a good law is and oppose actively that law which is reducing the freedom of people and destroying economies. Okay? So the principles are, the first principle is freedom. And when, when these same principles, awkwardly, I have found in a major document, which is a Communist Opinia Doctorum of European Union law professors and practitioners. And that is the draft common frame of reference for the law of contracts of the European Union. I'm repeating. The draft common frame of reference for contract law of the European Union. A document which was finished about 2011-2012, which has around 4,600 pages, which was done by about probably 200 European professors. And Professor Christian von Barr and um, Professor Gestin from France, Jacques Gestin, were the main organizers of the project. And in the principles of that magnum opus, they set these four, these four principles, which I was actually teaching my students in the 90s at this law school, inspired by Radbruch. So it's freedom, which is freedom of contract, and generally the principle of freedom. Let people live in freedom. Don't restrict their behavior unless uh, they restrict the equal freedom of others. That's the basic principle of law enshrined in the you know, uh, Declaration of Independence and uh, the French Declaration of Rights uh, of Man and Citizen and so forth. The Universal Charter also. So the principle of freedom, the principle of justice. That is essential. People often say, law is one thing, but equity, fairness, justice is something different. Don't be naive to think that uh, law must be just, that it must be equitable. Well, those people are lying you. That is not true. Law must be based on the feeling of justice of the majority of the people. But there are fundamental rights which the majority cannot take away from anyone, like life, liberty, and property. The Declaration of Independence of the United States and then other documents following that document. Originally written in the Virginia Bill of Rights. So, justice is an essential trait of law. It is the root of law. And every legal norm, if it brings about unjust, unequitable results, should be repelled, should be uh, re repudiated should, sh you should you should struggle against it a law cannot bring about injustice that is essential but justice can never be absolute um, law must also be efficient so the principle of efficiency of law must be also part of good norms good legal principles, good laws. You have always, you know, if, if you are to look for a killer, criminal act, a killer who killed someone, there was no cameras. So there is no absolute proof that he's the killer. You have to bring some principle of probability into the proof of the case in order to find most killers. And that is that principle of beyond reasonable doubt. If you ask for absolute proof, many killers will remain free. If you say the principle, the, 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 the standard of proof is beyond reasonable doubt, you will probably uh, put in prison 90% uh, of killers, maybe 5% 
of innocence will also be in prison, which happens. But then it comes up to you. Do you want absolute justice? And if that absolute justice brings about 90% killers which are not actually in prison, or making a 5% mistake, you have to balance the situation and then to introduce into your thinking the principle of efficiency, of effectiveness of the system. So if you just want absolute justice, it will not work. You have to balance it with the principle of efficiency in the right way. And a smart lawyer knows how to do that, how to find this balance between justice and efficiency so as to bring justice to, mo to the vast majority of people. Okay? And of course, legal security. And legal security has two aspects. One is equality before the law. Everybody must be equally treated before the law. And second, predictability of adjudication. And third, which I didn't put here, is a relative stability of the law, that the laws are not changed too quickly. Because then people cannot adapt and know exactly how to behave. Because uh, you have to know the law in order to abide by it, right? So, the principle of legal security. These four principles you must always have in mind as criteria and um, each law, each legal principle, each norm in a law must contain all these elements, must contain all these elements in order to be considered good law in a substantive way. So, as I said, each norm, legal principle must reasonably weigh and balance between these fundamental principles of Gustav Radbruch and the principles also enshrined in this uh, draft frame of reference of the European Union. I think that's a good standard for you to judge laws. Now, the question is, uh, if life brings you a, into a situation that you are tasked with changing the laws in your country or the European Union. How should you approach this task? It may be quite overwhelming because for a lawyer, that is like the ultimate job he can do. You are regulating the life of millions of people. It's quite exciting, actually. And you can do a lot of harm or you can do a lot of good. So better be prepared and think well before you draft something. So I'm giving you a toolkit how to prepare yourself for this situation. So you first need to develop uh, a detailed knowledge of that law which you are going to think about and maybe draft. You must understand the domestic law which you are dealing with. You must understand its shortcomings and its qualities so that you deal with the shortcomings but not destroy the good parts of it. Because the main principle, you know, is don't change what does not have to be changed. Okay. Because this principle of continuity is a part of the principle of legal security. Don't change whatever you don't have to change. So learn what are the problems, the shortcomings, but also preserve the good aspects of it. Don't change what, need, what doesn't need to be changed. Then... Don't be, please, don't just be lawyers. Be much more than just lawyers. Don't look into the texts of the law exclusively. Of course, you as lawyers are focused on the laws, but you have to understand the life, which is the source of those laws. The life that is inspiring those laws. The demands of life which are imposing certain Ways how to regulate those uh, relations between people. If you're in business law, you must exactly know the thinking, the reasoning of the businessman. What is a justifiable interest that he advocates? What is not a justifiable interest? You must recognize the nuances of their behaviors so as to be able to productively regulate the relationship. It's very important not to overregulate. Overregulation is a problem because then you are jeopardizing the principle of freedom. You're pressing down, you are super regulating 
economy, which is very wrong. It's probably more problematic to hyper-regulate than to under-regulate. Because the principle of freedom, which is in essence of a good economy, will then be suppressed. You always have to think of those four principles that I was telling you about. So you have to understand the, the life, the situation which you are regulating. Then you have certain institutions which are to apply those laws. Is it the court? Is it some administrative body? Is it a special purpose body designed, for example, for restitution, designed to do restitution as a campaign in a country? You must understand the mentality of the cadastra. You must understand the mentality of, of, uh, of a provincial court. So um, when you write laws, you must think of the people who are applying those laws and write the law in a way that those people understand that law. Not everybody is Hegel and Kant, right? So the laws must be understandable and well fit for, well fit for that institution which is to apply those laws. I wrote, you, you must understand the spirit of the institution that um, is to implement that law. And also, part of your job may be to fit the institution, to amend the organization of that institution so as to better be able to carry on the task that you have uh, tasked them with by that law. Then find the main problems in the existing law. Find what are the life problems which need to be solved by that law. That is essential. Your job is to remove those problems and to try to remove them by effective practical solutions which will be easily implemented and that every major problem is removed in a practical, you know, lively way. Law is a very practical discipline. There is a lot of theory about it. There are very many principles and too many professors but it has to serve the simple life of people and be practical in solving life, uh, life situations, both to, to natural persons and to businesses. So you have to find those problems, real life problems, and to find legal ways how to solve those problems practically. As was the case, for example, in the mortgage law, where I said, okay, if, if we don't have the object on which we can put the mortgage, we'll put the mor we'll, we'll, we'll right, inscribe the mortgage on the land on which that object is built because everybody knows that that object exists physically on that piece of land. So if he's thinking about buying a flat on the third floor, he will look into the land registry and see that there is a mortgage on the third floor flat inscribed on the piece of land on which that property is. Understood? So that is a simple solution. But then you must also empower... Uh, for example, the cadastra to know how to do that. So when, when this law was passed, I made a big lecture to all the cadastras in Serbia to tell them exactly how they should apply the law. That is very important. So I said, assist them in the implementation of the law. Assist them in implementation of the law. And then when you have solved all the major problems, then you move on to the next, next task in helping your country. It's a very patriotic thing to write laws because you are doing good to so many people. Okay, now, <clears throat> um, what is the purpose of law? Is the purpose of law for you to make money, to drive BMWs, Mercedes, to, to, to travel in first class? Is that the purpose of law? Is the purpose of law to employ clerks? The purpose of law is maintaining peace between people by and promoting material and moral, pro moral progress. So two things. On the one hand, if law is just, if it is equitable, if the results of law are equitable, if the judgments passed are equitable, everybody knows what is fair, what is unfair. The worst criminal in the world distinguishes what is fair and what is unfair. So if someone who is guilty 
is accused and imprisoned or has to pay a fine or has to pay serious damages, he will finally accept that because deep down he or she feels that it is fair. On the other hand, if you impose an unjust, corrupt judgment on the most decent and peaceful person, he may take up a machine gun and kill seven people. Again, in protest from unfairness of his personal treatment. So this idea of justice actually relaxes tensions in society and everybody somehow accepts the rule of law. That's why I say that the main purpose of law is maintaining peace. It's not creating conflict, it's resolving conflict. And you as lawyers could, should always, when adjudicating, when writing contracts, when deciding as, as, as judges or as prosecutors, your idea is to give justice because that brings peace into society. And the purpose of law is peace. And second, it's not just passive peace in a desert where, where you have, you know, uh, hungry people. Uh, law must be a promoter of progress and a promoter of moral values as well, material and moral values. So this is the ultimate purpose of law, how I see it. The moral progress of human beings, of the environment as one independent object of protection, because without environment, and we're having here Professor Drenovac, the best professor of environmental law in the Balkans, um, environment is so endangered that it must become an, an independent object of protection apart from human beings and animals and so forth, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, so uh, generally, a law is to protect human beings, environments, societies, and mankind in general. How does law do that? By equitable weighing of justified interests. You as a lawyer, you have interests of one party, second party, third party, and you're weighing those interests. And you're discrediting those interests which are not justified. But you are acknowledging other interests which are justified and taking them into equation of your solution of a conflict between uh, people and companies. Have in mind that law is not God-given. Um, this law that we have, the worldly law that we have here, is written by people. And it's in, it's in essence a convention between people. It's an agreement. So as long as that agreement exists, that is law. When the agreement changes, then something else becomes law. So it is conventional in nature. And therefore, it is changeable. It is variable. Law is not an end in itself. Don't fall into the trap of those high-geared lawyers who, you know, dressed in 3,000 euro suits and driving um, Mercedes S 663, you know, uh, B-Turbo and so forth. Um, uh, you know, exaggerate law. Law is a tool. It's one of the tools for humane living. So, law in itself is not a purpose. It is a tool for achieving the result of maintaining peace and promoting progress of society. So, if it may not become a limitation for development of the society. If you feel that law is limiting progress, then change it. Don't hesitate to change it if it is an inhibitory factor if it is blocking development of society. And we know here in Serbia, and I, I'm sure that in every society, 
irrespective of how modern it is, lawyers are typically very conservative. And they're often blocking development of the economy and of many other things. So be progressive, be modern. Uh, that does not mean that you will uh, now be some Protestants who are, uh, you know, um, uh, destroying the fundamentals of law. No, no, no. Just adapt. Adapt to the new needs because as Sir Roy Good of uh, the, the most famous English professor of law, he says, commercial uh, law is the legal answer to the needs of the businesses. It's an answer. It's not a purpose in itself. It's a response. It's the legal response to the needs of solid, productive, engaged businesses. Um, often I had debates with um, famous lawyers, including some from this law school, that I have transgressed and violated some principles of law. And um, always they were invoking principles which are of less significance, less fundamental than the four principles that I talked about. Justice, effectiveness, legal security, and freedom. There are other principles. I'll just to give you an example. In mortgage law, in hypothecation law, there is the principle of specificity. Uh, if you have a mortgage or if you have a pledge, it must be on this individual thing. And then life brings about a need to expand that principle. And in French law, they call it a mortgage on the fond de commerce. Fond de commerce, right? That's what you call it. It's like a group of assets which are changing. For example, uh, a tire warehouse. And new tires are coming in and those are being sold. But there is a mortgage on the warehouse. So the principle of specificity is relativized because it's put on the whole warehouse, which is a composition of a number of individual things which are fluctuating. The English call it the floating charge. We have introduced that in the law on non-possessory pledges. We have in introduced the pledge on a warehouse, which is changing as a fluctuating group of assets. That is a violation of the principle of specificity. Of course it is, because life demands it. It's practical. So the principle of effectiveness is more important than the principle of specificity. Of course, the principle of specificity is the basic principle. But here is a, a requisite, a needed exception from the principle, which makes things more practical and useful in life. You understand? So um, the principles are there. They are the guiding principle. You, you think through principles. When you uh, come to conclusions about law, you, you, your main thinking goes through principles. But those principles are changing. And in different situations, the hierarchy of principles can alter. And you, as an artist of law, must know how to articulate that hierarchy of principles in your head. Many do not know that. Um, I think it is very important for you to read one document which you have probably not read yet. Because often people don't uh, learn it at law schools, and that is the B Virginia Bill of Rights. I find that document to be fascinating. The Virginia Bill of Rights from 1776. It has some 15 points. Go through them and think deeply about them. And I think you'll find a lot of inspirations as lawyers in that document. I, I call that document the mother document of modern statehood. Talking about law as a convention, I have a question to ask you. Um, are our social sciences exact or are they a matter of convictions? We know that physics, in physics, the law of um, action and reaction, the measurement of speed, you know, the, the relations, kinetic, um, static energies, and so forth. It's all very measurable. You have formulas. And you can predict how to make a bridge. Now, in this room, 
there are people of various political attitudes. Does that mean, actually, that social sciences are not exact? Does that mean that there is no truth in social sciences, including law? Or there is truth, but in postmodern societies, truth is not popular. Have you thought about it? You know, when you write laws, when you make decisions as politicians, you have a certain worldview which you brought from your home. You have a certain set of values that you bring to the table. I had situations sitting in, sitting in government that I was dealing with people who are my colleagues in the government, co-ministers, which were thinking everything opposite for me. And that is a complicated situation. It's much easier if you have a group of like-minded people who are running certain reforms. So you must, as lawyers, not only be technicians. Do not be passive appliers of law. You must, or you should, you don't have to, but I think it's very exciting that you develop what the Germans call a Weltanschauung. Right? Are you German? Yeah. Weltanschauung. With two U's. Weltanschauung. Exactly. exactly. Develop a Weltanschauung because a lawyer without a Weltanschauung is like a car without tires. You know, um, you are a technician if you don't have a set of beliefs which you are fairly convinced at an early age and then at my age you become sure that they're true. So, um, this is my message to you in closing of, of, of this small lecture. Um, delve deeper into the law. Explore its social truths. Explore the relations between law, economy, psychology, religion, sociology, love, whatever. Think about all those forces which amalgamate in what we call law and live in it. Make it alive through analyzing social relations that you are dealing with. And then you will feel the beauty and the glory and the purpose of law. I believe that there are, that law and economy is an exact science similar to physics and chemistry. It's a very unpopular attitude because everybody ha has the right to his opinion. But you know, it is a fact of life that some societies which abide by certain principles are consistently more or less successful. And then there are other societies which apply some other principles opposite from these first societies which are more or less always stuck in poverty and where people are living a poor life in all ways, not just materially, but morally as well. Uh, so my message to you is, uh, think, it, think of it that way, in, in the following way. You have, in, in natural sciences, you have experiments. In social sciences, you have ex post Results of experiments. The communists came to power in 1917. And they're actually still today destroying Russia. Consistently since 1917, 106 years, they are destroying Russia. Because the principles which they are applying are wrong. The inputs into their social uh, formula which they are applying are wrong. 
So there is something that is patently right in successful societies, and those are those truthful laws that your job is to discover. Applying those laws, which systematically over decades and some, with, some, with some countries like the United States for centuries bring very productive results. All in all, no society is perfect, but you have societies which are much better, much better organized than others. Therefore, I again draw your attention to the Virginia Bill of Rights. So with this, I wish you good luck in your intellectual life journey of discovering what the truth in law is. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Parvodic. Uh, we now have some time for a few questions, so be free, uh, feel free to ask anything you uh, want to know about this topic or relatable topics, please. Yes? Please just turn the mic on. Because it's recording. Ah, oh, okay. Um, actually, I just wanted to add something to the truth in social science. Because I'm a political scientist myself, so I think it's quite interesting to have your point of view as a lawyer. Um, what I was thinking is actually that everyone has its own perception, conception of truth, especially in social sciences. Because you have sciences like physics, chemistry, where there is an exact definition even though, yes, okay, not always, but you get my point. In social sciences, there are definitions of things. What is liberalism, for example, even though there are differences among thinkers. But a precise definition doesn't exist, I think. It's the perception of every people might be different. For example, in international relations, you have interdependence, which is very important, but you have a severe clash between the uh, realism and liberalism. So everyone has its own perception of truth, I think. Uh, that is unquestionable that everyone has his own perception of truth. But in my opinion, that does not diminish the fact that truth exists independent of those views. And it is up to you to discover what that truth is by analyzing history. Because history is teaching us very vividly uh, and, and in picturesque ways uh, what wrong decisions bring about and what right decisions bring about. Just compare the results of Konrad Adenauer on the one hand and of Joseph Stalin, their contemporaries. What one did to his nation and what the other did to his nations. And how one thought and how the other thought. And just analyze the characters of Konrad Adenauer on the one hand and Joseph Stalin on the other hand, and you will come much, much closer to the idea of, of, of objective truth. That's my, my conviction. Is there any other questions? I'm very open, please. No, I, I have a question. All right. So, would you say that, um, like, for example, like uh, you, you were talking uh, about a Russian applied principle, and would you say that the relation that Serbia always had with Russia kind of slowed down the process through to get closer to you and the idea of economy and society that you presented to us? <clears throat> yes, that is definitely the fact that um, a number of um, people in, in this society um, feel quite close to, um, to, 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 to Russia in general, to the Russian nation, which is perfectly okay. Uh, the problem is that some of them feel close to Putin. That is, that is, that is the big problem. And that is, is slowing down uh, definitely uh, the progress towards the European Union. But we hope that this will change in these days as we are now speaking. To a certain extent, significantly in the next few days, we expect some major breakthroughs. Any other questions? Okay, if there is no other questions, I first uh, like to, uh, to thank the Mr. Parvodic.
uh, for being with us today and for the great lesson. Uh, I think it was uh, quite interesting and also for sharing with us uh, his uh, rich experience and knowledge in this field. Thank you, and thank you also for attending this lecture.